how does flexlon work? So at the core of it, you've got this flexlon singleton. And you can see that whenever you drop any sort of uh, any sort of flexlon component into the scene, this singleton gets created for you. And this thing has a update loop inside it. It runs at on late update. Uh, let's see if I can just show some code here. On late update, it's going to go through the whole scene, check for any root nodes that are dirty, and then go and update them. What are root nodes? So they're the root, they're any, basically any game object, the first, the topmost game object that has any sort of uh, layout component on it. So in this case, we've got this flexible layout. This is one root node. Uh, we've got this flexible layout, which is another root node. So we've got two root nodes in this scene. So it's going to go and check those guys and ask them, hey, are you? do you need an update? So step one, it's going to check 30 nodes for an update. Now when, how did, how did they become dirty in the first place? When you make a change or some change happens at runtime to your scene, uh, most of the changes made to flex on layouts flex on object, the parent-child relationships, those are all automatically tracked. Um, you can see this pretty easily if you just go to flex on object. Every time you change, for example, the width, the width type in this case, uh, it's going to mark itself as dirty. And what that's going to do is it's going to mark this object as dirty and then work its way up the tree and mark every object up to the root as also dirty. And basically, the reason for that is because if the size of a child changes, it could affect how objects are laid out in the parent layout. Uh, it doesn't affect the other children in that layout. It just affects this object and its its parents up to the root. So any property changes, I guess, step zero. <laughs> zero. Any property changes, marking a Markings now nodes as dirty. Then every frame flexlon component is going to check, see what is dirty, and go and update those components. And the way it does it is in two steps. Step one, it's going to measure. Uh, well, it's more like three steps. Measure, arrange, and I guess apply. So in the measure step, it's going to say, okay, for things that are dirty, what are their sizes? Uh, and it does this in multiple passes because sometimes there's a circular dependency between the parent size and the child size. So it's going to do a few passes to kind of suss out what is the size of each layout? What is the size of each child object? Um, and then it's going to go back to those layouts and say, now that I, now all the sizes are understood and cached, go and arrange the layouts. And this just does a single pass on every layout that is dirty. It goes in and calls its arrange function to do the actual job. All of this happens in kind of a special space uh, where the layouts don't need to think too much about things like, what if my route is rotated? What if you know the user decided to add a scale to things? What if I'm in the middle of an animation? Uh, these are done kind of in a space where you're kind of insulated from thinking about all that complicated stuff. Um, you don't need to think about margins and padding because uh, all that is kind of taken care outside of this. It's just here's the bare minimum information you need to get the job done to measure the sizes and then arrange the layouts. Then a bunch of transformations happen and we find the final value that we want each object to be at. And we call uh, this, this apply pass to go through each object that is not already where it needs to be and try to move it towards that position. So this is where we get things like the animators coming in, where, we, where the animators might say, uh, I want to just move it 10% towards this target position, or I want to follow a curve, or I want to use physics to push it towards this target position. Um, and so that's done through in a uh, transform update.
looking at this briefly, if you go to the layout uh, interface, you can see that it needs to call this measure function potentially more than once. Uh, with this information, which node are we trying to measure? Uh, what size do we does the user specify that it needs to be? So if the user has said it needs to be component size or fixed size or whatever, what is the size that it needs to be? What is the minimum value that the user specified? What is the maximum value the user specified? From this, it kind of comes out with, okay, what are the bounds of the measurement of this object? And then once all the measurements are done, it goes and arranges the object. Uh, the, the, the layout goes and arranges it, its children. So if you want to try your own layout, you just need to implement these two methods, basically. But that would be really difficult to do by itself. And so there is this base class that inherit that implements this, this interface. And basically, you just override the measure and arrange functions. And there's this, there's some helpers here for that as well. Um, as an example, there's a custom layout. Uh, this custom layout that comes in the samples that shows you how to override, or how to subclass layout base and kind of implement uh, a really comprehensive, I think, layout. You don't always need to do all of these things, um, but this thing is is built so that it shows you how to compute the, the layout size based on the size of the children if you need it, uh, how to add a gap between them. Uh, take that aggregate size and then min-max it between the min and max. Um, and then uh, if there are any children that need to shrink or need to fill their parent, how to apply that. It does all the features. You don't, If you don't care for some of those features, like I don't care if these are specified as a min or max, and we just got to ignore it, and you could just you know skip this part of it. Or if you think, I don't really care if the children are fill size, you don't need to deal with this part of it um, if there are, if you guarantee that they're always going to be a fixed size. So, and then the, the range function is actually typically pretty simple. It's just given the objects and their sizes, how are you going to arrange them? What is your algorithm? And, and then the sample case, it arranges them diagonally stacked. It's kind of like a flexible layout, but diagonal. So that is layouts. And then there's the question. So I've created this fancy custom layout here. Uh, but let's say now I wanted to size these objects. Uh, how, how are these sizes of these objects determined in the first place? And right now, it's doing whatever the default is that Flexlon decides. So in this case, it's saying I have a mesh render component on it. So I'm going to take the size of this sphere mesh. That's going to be the size of this object. Um, and if I were to remove this uh, mesh render, now it's instead saying, I'm going to use this sphere collider. Um, and as I increase and decrease the collider size, you can see it changes the size. And there's a few different built-in ones. You can take a look at the different ones in the Flexlon adapter this uh, function of like create a default adapter for this thing if one doesn't already exist. So it supports text, it supports images, supports canvas, rec transforms, sprites, meshes, colliders. Um, so if you have something that's not one of those, or you do have one of those, but you actually want it to be sized differently, maybe you have a specific aspect ratio you're going for, or in the case, the example that we saw earlier with the birds, I want to use the texture size of the image that's attached to this uh, mesh instead of just the mesh size. Then you need to add your own custom adapter. And the way to do that is to implement this interface at the top, which is three methods. So you want to say, and typically you, don't, you only need to implement two of them. Uh, the first one is the really important one is given this requested size by the user, and this min and max, how are you going to measure the size of this node? And you can take a look through here. There's some helpers that will help you with that. Um, and then there is how do you, given the size, now you've, you've told us the size of the node, how are you going to modify the transform scale to apply that size? Because not everything needs to, to change the transform scales. For example, in this case, I think it 
does, yes. So instead of changing this radius, it's going to change this transform scale. You can imagine a different adapter that instead of changing the scale, keeps the scale the same, but then changes the radius of the sphere to match whatever the flexible and object size should be. Different cases, for example, when we're doing 2D, we don't want to change the scales of things. We want to change typically the rec transform. Uh, so that's what this other one is about. Maybe you don't want to change the scale, but you do want to change the rect size based on the measured size of your object. So if you look at the example image adapter, the way it does its work is first it finds the texture that it wants to use as its size. It does that on update. And then given the texture, it implements measure by saying, I'm going to take the size of this texture pass it to this little helper function that'll maintain aspect ratio. And that's it. It returns that, that measure size. Um, and then it says, okay, so now that I have the size, I actually want to scale the transform so that this qu the quad is squished to fit that measured size. But it doesn't deal with rect transform, so it just returns false in that case. So hopefully that is a helpful overview of how this works. And so you've got the measure step, which is checking the layout measure and adapter measure. Then the arrange step, which is calling layout.arrange. And then finally the Transform updater is being used in the apply method. Um, there is uh, another piece of the adapter is here is used as well, which is the try get scale or get sets. So I guess the last piece is the transform updater which is how animations are implemented. It's not too complicated of an interface, but it does have to deal with position rotation to scale and rect size separately. So basically you say, uh, this pre-update is just in case you need to do something before the update, like capture the current world transform or something like that. Uh, but then these other methods are the important ones of, okay, Flexlon has computed that this is the final position of the object, this position and in local space. And you need to then tell, uh, you need to actually change the, the game object somehow to move towards that position. And similarly, this is the rotation flex on as computed. You need to go to that location uh, and same with scale and rect size. So this is how the lerp animator is implemented. Uh, it says, for example, in update position, it depending on if you want it to animate in world space or not. Uh, let's take the simple case of local space. It's simply computing. <clears throat> it's simply doing a lerp between its current transform position to its desired position set by Flexalon at some interpolation speed. And then the return value here is, are you done or not? And this is a performance optimization because we don't want to keep calling this method forever. Uh, when, when it's actually reached the final position, Flexlon will stop, stop updating this object.